time. It's been many months since I've recorded a video. That's because I'm a regular working stiff like everybody else. I work a job. I've got uh, many projects in the, in the buyer. And uh, I do videos when I have time. I've taken also taken time to review the first 12 episodes and the responses that I've gotten. Um, actually, I expected more negative response uh, of questioning uh, my experiments. Uh, did they actually find the results that I found? As then, the velocity of propagation is dependent on the frequency, where all of physics wants to say that the propagation velocity is fixed, that a sound wave moves at a specific velocity at a specific temperature, when in fact, if you increase the frequency, it actually goes faster. And these experiments in the waveguides actually uh, produce the results, and uh, all the way up to the, uh, the experiment with the, the laser, uh, showing that the velocity of light changes depending on the color that the propagation velocity of light is not the same. That means that ultraviolet light is faster than red light, and then ultraviolet light overtakes red light. So as a result, our measurements of, of the universe, including the Big Bang, are wrong. So um, I've decided that uh, to, before I go into episode 13, um, 1 through 12 spent a lot of time on combustion, which is actually a really interesting function that has also been misidentified because com combustion is actually a reordering of space elementally by space as we've seen that oxygen and hydrogen at one weight after combined weigh less and take up less mass. So uh, that's a real different hook on combustion. Uh, and the next episodes, uh, 13 and on, uh, I don't know how many episodes there'll be, there may be many more, uh, but uh, it shows uh, combustion is, is really a fascinating concept and uh, more important than we might think about how it describes the universe. The idea of the Big Bang, uh, if we finally get to the point of where we realize that the universe did not have a beginning, and we start thinking in infinite concepts rather than finite concepts, as in there being um, not a smallest particle and not an ultimate dimension as to the size of the universe, that the multiverse is true, and when you look out, that's what you're actually seeing, the infinitely small to the infinitely large, with no limit to the number of galaxies. So if we stop being limited in our thinking and start realizing that we had a beginning, but the universe did not, a whole new panacea of physics opens up. Before I started producing episode 13, I thought I'd return to all the episodes with a quick review, episodes one through 12. We began with episode one, which was all about differentials. Uh, these are existential truths about physics, um, hot, cold, light, dark, hard and soft. And I introduced the uh, concept that zero does not exist. Um, in thermodynamics, you would have to be absolutely zero pressure, zero temperature, absolute zero non-existence, which is, um, as the universe is going to show us, doesn't exist. Um, there's a simple opposition or juxtaposition of isotropy and entropy which is um, uh, like the high density of a neutron star as opposed to the vaporous nebulous gas in a, in, in a nebula. Um, and then I also brought in um, that masses are all made up of smaller masses. That means every particle is made up of smaller particles. And as we have seen, the proton breaks up into quarks. And uh, then we get to where we are now, which is the ultimately small Higgs boson which uh, I think you're gonna find that there is no such thing as the ultimate small particle. Next in episode one uh, was the, the point that all collisions are head on. And what that means is you can eliminate all the lateral vectors. Particles are coming for a collision. They may be skewing this way and going that way, but when they, what you, the only consideration would be the closing velocity, which means that all collisions are head on. Then the only determinant that you cannot determine about a collision is the rotation because it would have to be zero rotation over infinite time for it not to skew. That means all collisions, and if you look at the universe, skew. That means it's all crooked. There is no such thing as a straight line in the universe. And the other interesting thing, an existential fact about uh, physics, is that all masses are lumpy. Now we grind prisms to a very beautiful flatness, but when you look very closely, you'll find out that it's still lumpy, that uh, there is no such thing as a perfectly straight line or a perfectly flat surface. The other interesting point in episode one was the, that all events are soft events. 
that means that they're they're though it appears hard it's actually oscillating in a hysteresis and the event slowly approaches collides and bounces away and in that collision was an oscillation so all events in the universe are oscillatory the other thing that i brought out was a, a silly little equation or a value that says 1.0 to the infinity squared seems ridiculous because you can't multiply anything times infinity. But what that defines, what that's saying is that the universe is infinitely small and infinitely large. And anywhere you are in infinity, you're in the center. Then in episode number two, uh, I brought in concepts of gravity. Of course, the classic one is space-time dilation by Einstein. And I would like to point out that space is nothing and you can't expand nothing. The only thing that differentiates space is the distance between two particles or two heavenly bodies. And to have space-time dilation being the cause of gravity to me is ludicrous. Gravity is being caused by particle collision. That means with every heavenly body that you have, everything that's in space is being collided with by dark matter. And it's all shaded by some other object, which causes it to curve. What that means is that because, like, you skip a rock across the lake, it's being hit on the bottom more than on the top. That's why it glides in a hopping pattern. It's not being attracted to the planet, it's being pushed to the planet. So, uh, essentially, because of the differential of more collisions on one side of a, an entity than the other, just like you're being pushed to the planet because there's more pressure of dark matter pushing you in, holding you together and shoving you to the planet, as well as the entire atmosphere, that's uh, the, the reason for gravity. Then I also in episode two, I bring up uh, the magician's trick. I bring in the concept of magnetism, uh, which is the source of all the confusion because we see a, mag a magnets attract each other, reverse them, turn them around and they push each other apart. When in fact, there is only push, there is only particle collision and the reaction of dark matter and a magnet is a dark matter lens. So if you have a lens or a collimated uh, neodymium magnet or a piece of ferrite steel or a ferrite metal that's been magnetized, it directs the, the dark matter through the device in such a direction that as you collimate it in one direction, the dark matter is colliding, you reverse it, you push know. apart. So uh, uh, you might start looking at uh, uh, magnetism and a magnet as a dark matter lens. Also in episode two, uh, like we, I brought out, uh, Professor Brainstein brings out that energy is something that mass possesses. Energy is not an entity unto itself. So, uh, and yes, energy and matter have an equivalence because matter was assembled inside of a star at millions of degrees and millions of pounds of pressure. And it was star collision that destroyed the stars, picked it out into the deadness of space, and they cooled off and all the elements froze. So iron and zinc and oxygen and hydrogen, all of these were, were assembled at different layers inside of a star. And as, as they kicked out at their equivalent mass, they froze and they turned into what we know today as atoms. Now they're defined as protons, neutrons, orbited by electrons, which we'll find out is totally wrong. But nonetheless, I just call it the core of the atom. So the idea of a zero radius photon is a fool's solution because there is zero radius of what, okay? So we, we're saying that this zero radius point has a photon's energy and therefore it's measurable. I'm sorry, it's not measurable. The only thing we begin to measure are real matter, which is electrons. Uh, and the photon is actually oscillations in dark matter, which makes absolute sense. So then I did the experiment where I take two flashlights with color filters, one of them red, one of them blue, and I shine them on a mirror on the table, and I show how when they separate and they shine up on the whiteboard, you get red and you get blue, but down on the mirror, they are magenta. So they mix in the mirror, but then they separate as individual waves. Now with electrical waves, they actually sum. If you have two electrical waves at two different frequencies and you look at it on the oscilloscope, they sum together and they mix together and they're really not separable once they've been mixed together. So what it amounts to with light, light is waves moving through dark matter, which we'll see is a true entity, 
Waves move through dark matter because no mass is moving linearly. Only the oscillation is moving. And the oscillation now can move at the speed of light and it's massless. Then I introduced the single slit laser experiment where previously you've seen the double slit experiment, which actually is flawed because there's actually four ridges and four interference patterns, but nobody's discovered that. But the single slit produces two horizontal beams that interfere with each other. So it's actually the two edges, which are round because there's no such thing as a square edge. You cannot make a square edge. It produces a curvature and the laser beam actually wraps around both of the blades, producing two horizontal beams. The next I do uh, a, a little experiment where I pass non-coherent white light through a, through a slit. Now this is a single slit and uh, show how it produces no interference pattern. It's just a foggy edge where it passes through. And then um, I take a moment to dispute the Niels Bohr atom. Um, which uh, I will do again and again and again through this whole series. Um, then I begin uh, combustion part one, um, and I present a causality, which is one event causes another event, which causes another event. And I make a statement that says it takes fire to make fire. And quite frankly, you can put hydrogen and oxygen together in a tank, run them all the way up to 700 degrees, and they won't burn. It takes a catalyst or a spark to make them combine. Then I uh, take a minute to establish the, uh, uh, the basics of thermodynamics, which is uh, as you compress something, it gets hot. And when you expand something, it takes on heat. And you can say, well, it gets cool. No, it's actually taking on heat, which causes everything else to get cool. And actually, uh, when you uh, compress air, compress it into, a, say, a can, and then remove the heat from it, that compressed air can then, do, then again do work. It's like when we put, um, uh, have a compressor and we have uh, air tools, we pump the air into the tank, the tank gets hot, but then it cools off, but then that compressed air can then again do work and produce heat. Cut. Next I establish, establish the values of hydrogen and oxygen, um, the actual uh, weight per mole and then uh, explain how the uh, uh, explain the, the ins and outs of the pressure volume equations. And then I began a, the complex calx of actually counting atoms, the, the amount of atoms in a mole of hydrogen, the amount of atoms in a mole of oxygen, and the combined uh, after combustion, how they weigh less than they did when they were separate entities. And then uh, I began the, the, to lay out the, the extensive or complex uh, uh, thought experiment where I do all of the, uh, uh, all of the functions uh, that actually lead up to this summation. Then in episode four, things get really laborious. The math gets heavy, the details will bore most people, but uh, the, the devil's in the details. Uh, I'm sorry this is complex, but it is complex. In this thought experiment, we use a thousand centimeter tank. Uh, this is a, a, a specifically a thousand cubic centimeters because we're gonna expand the quantities of hydrogen and oxygen, which are different values into the tank. And it has to come out to be a thousand cubic centimeters. But we find out when we expand it up at 70 degrees, hydrogen and oxygen expand at different ratios. Hydrogen is 848 to one and oxygen is 861 to one. So when we expand them up, we end up with 1,036 cubic centimeters when we actually need 1,000. So what we do is we use the isobaric equation to adjust the temperature. We find out the, the volume that we would like to have and the isobaric equation will tell you what temperature we need to be at in order to achieve that. So we use the isobaric equation and then we check it with the volumetric equation. And that's how we end up at 76, uh, 70, uh, 70, uh, 67.5 degrees is exactly 1,000 cubic centimeters of our quantities of hydrogen and oxygen. It was at this point uh, that I realized that I needed to go deeper into quantum physics. Um, I, I, I described the uh, hydrogen as a hexagon when frozen solid and the oxygen is actually a square when they're at uh, super cold temperatures and hard like crystals. Atoms are liquid inside of a star. 
And when they were kicked away from the star, the star collided and exploded and threw down into empty space, they froze. So what you're handling in all the substances are actually frozen atoms. Their natural state is liquid. And you can imagine like when you see a welder welding steel, it's liquid at, at really high temperatures. That's its natural state. Nothing moves inside of an atom unless it is pushed. They don't have electrons orbiting around it and the neutrons and the protons, which actually it's all the same stuff, it's the core of the atom, is solid. It's a crystal. Atoms decay over millions of years. There's a unique one, uh, carbon-14, which decays over 5,730 years, which is why they can do carbon dating, you can measure how long the carbon has been in existence. Then I go into and I explain the push theory, once again the push theory, that magnetism is the source of the confusion. Since magnets attract and they push apart, we, we see that they uh, are attractive, there's the attractive force. And this is where um, uh, the attractive force comes from in the strong and weak nuclear forces that bind the, uh, the uh, proton and neutron together and that they attract the electron and the electron and the proton attract each other. So therefore it's held in orbit when it doesn't even exist. Atom, or electrons don't orbit atoms. Um, and I continue to harp on there are only push forces. Then I continue to explain, well I should say Lucy continues to explain and the reason I use Lucy is because uh, her voice is so much more pleasing than my gravelly voice. And she can read the details and not mess things up the way I have to repeat and repeat. Uh, she, uh, uh, she does such a better job. So that's, that's why. And, and she's nice to listen to. Um, and I've had people say, well, there's better voices out on the market now. But uh, it's a computer voice and I'm content with it. Uh, the topic is what is important. So then she, uh, she goes on in, in episode four and explains the layering, that uh, particles inside of an atom are in layers. They're not clumped together with protons and neutrons. It's actually layers of compressed substance, which actually goes all the way down to the dimension of dark matter, which drops into infinity. This will be explained later on in the treatise, all the way towards the end. There's actually a definition for dark matter, and you'll see that is defined, and you'll be able to finally see dark matter. Then Lucy describes the, the, uh, the process of adding energy to atoms and how the action is in an atom is actually swelling. It can be oscillatory, but when you add energy to atoms, they swell up and they oscillate larger and smaller. They don't move around, they're stationary, but they get larger if you get add heat to them, they swell. It's much like the ring and ball experiment your science teacher did or should have done where they have a brass ring and a ball. The ring will not pass over the ball, but then he puts it in an alcohol burner, warms it up, and the ring will slip over the ball. That shows the expansion of atoms by adding heat energy. Then in episode four, uh, Lucy and I uh, describe layering, which is prevalent throughout the entire universe. If you look at uh, the layers of the earth, they're substantial layers in even in sediments. And then you look at the layers of the sun. There are so many layers in the sun. Uh, it's all these layers where the atoms were formed. Layering is, is uh, common throughout everything in the universe. And why would we think that that wouldn't maintain itself on down into the quantum scale when in fact it does? They're not clumps of protons and neutrons that are clung together by the strong nuclear force. They are actually layers of matter pushed together under huge pressure, and they themselves are in layers down to the very core of an atom, multiple layers. And that's borne out and shown in spectral analysis. What you're actually looking at, and I'll show later on, are the layers in an atom that show up in the spectral analysis of, of, of the atoms. Then in episode four, uh, dive into uh, the spectral analysis. Uh, it's interesting how hydrogen only has four lines uh, that are produced by its proton and electron. Uh, and oxygen has 54 lines. It shows how complex oxygen is. I would say how many layers oxygen actually has. And then uh, I go into the details of how you structure the spectral analysis against the actual physical size of the atom and you're able to actually measure the size of the layers and where they, where they reside within the atom itself. 
And actually, uh, spectral analysis is going to show that we can tell more about an atom than any other analysis can do. Spectral analysis will be the future. So uh, then a uh, little bit of discussion about um, uh, adding electrons to, uh, to an atom actually add energy. It becomes an ion, uh, meaning to say that, that as electrons are added, it's ionized and as it's taken away, it becomes a negative ion. So there you have the atom sitting here swelling up with electrical charge and decreasing in size with uh, electrical electrons leaving. Um, it's actually electrons are transition, the transition matter between dark matter and actual physical matter, as we described it. Electrons can be affected with magnetism and dark matter or light waves cannot. The Newtonian approach to shapes works all the way down to the quantum scale. I know that's not mysterious. I mean, it's not all, all the wonderful quantum space analysis. It's Newtonian. It exists on, on a natural phenomenon. When you squeeze spheres together, they start to turn into a square. That means take three, actually you need four to start squeezing it together. What happens is they push in. They push in and what happens is it starts to square off. So you wonder why salt crystallizes as a square. You wonder why the uh, Jack Frost on the window does all these pretty patterns because oxygen wants to be a square and hydrogen wants to be a hexagon. So they argue with each other as they're crystallizing and becoming stationary, hard crystals. Uh, they form these unique patterns. So literally, atoms uh, on, the, on the quantum scale are, are affected by Newtonian physics. Really simple, simple pressure, collision, push, push something into tight compaction. What happens to the spherical nature? It disappears, it turns into a crystal which goes hexagon or square. There's only two shapes, actually three. There's a rhomboid in, in, in argon. Next in episode five, Professor Brainstein explains the air waveguide. He establishes that electromagnetic magnetic waves truly do travel at the speed of light down through the air waveguide. Then he explains the summing of electromagnetic waves and the summing of offsets. You were able to actually see the, the uh, lag time as the frequencies go up and, and um, they sum together. And then he demonstrates uh, the offset disturbances uh, between the, the frequencies, that as the different frequencies are too long or too short for the waveguide, how they actually sum and cause distortions in, in the standing wave. And then he talks about the time base um, that was established by using the decay of cesium, it became the cesium clock, which was accurate down to nine zeros or one nanosecond. The oscilloscope used in these tests is a 400 megahertz spectronics with a resolution controlled by crystals all the way to 100 picoseconds. Then he discusses that in uh, 1870, how the meter, the meter was a, a platinum iridium bar that uh, when placed in ice water had two marks on it, and those two marks were exactly one meter. So you can see how long, how far we've come, because in 1983 they established the, the meter to be the distance that light traveled. 3.33569. That was six. one divided by 299, 792, 458. And then he describes the summing of electrical waves and how that is not accomplished by light waves, how light waves cannot sum, they do not sum because they are not electromagnetic. They're waves in dark matter. Next he describes, uh, uh, he goes into extensively again and again, harping on phase velocity as being non-existent. That the group velocity and the phase velocity, that one wavelet all by itself will still diffract. It doesn't need any association with any other wave like group velocity and phase velocity to, to diffract through the prism. It is strictly the velocity of each different color. Next, he goes into sound waves and how the propagation velocity is not fundamental. And he uh, shows how uh, the learning experience of where he glued transducers onto the air wave guide, the aluminum air wave guide, and how he got a double standing wave because he get uh, sound going down through the air and through the metal and with cross, cross talk and it caused all kinds of problems. So he came up with the new steel bar uh, polished with transducers glued on the end with super glue. 
and uh, how and then he demonstrates how the uh, uh, the the received transducer is just as loud as the transmit transducer transfers perfectly down through the through the uh, through the ball. And then he goes into uh, uh, the uh, details of how coming up in episode six, all the measurements that were taken using the sound rebar and uh, the actual proof that the velocity of sound propagates, the propagation goes up as the frequency goes up. Now in episode six, there's all the details of the sound waves going through the, the steel rebar. Now the standing waves uh, prove that the propagation goes up as the frequency goes up. Now the truth is in the details, and as it's complex, many of the waveforms all look look the same, but the sounds were tested at a, at a specific laboratory temperature, and uh, all the way through the full gamut, all the way up to 20 megahertz. And then again, again, uh, disputes phase velocity, but he you know he can't get off something that is so important that it's a complete misobservation. And he also disputes uh, linear waves. Uh, you throw a pebble into a pond and you see the rings going out, and that's the linear wave, but what you're not seeing is the full three-dimensional wave that actually occurred. You have light waves, you have sound waves, you have mechanical waves, and it all happened in three dimensions. Linear waves, you're only seeing a slice. It's not the truth. Then Lucy does a good job at uh, describing all the errors in phase velocity, and they uh, finally say that you know, they're gonna stop harping on it. They think they've made the point. And uh, then they show the extensive, uh, extensive test uh, on an Excel spreadsheet, which you're able to pause and look at all the details of the uh, tests all the way from low frequencies all the way up to 20 megahertz. And then uh, Brainstein uh, describes the math uh, that, that is the proof. Uh, and if you take time to, to uh, study the math, you can pause and look at it and study the math you'll realize that it is, is an actual truth and proof in an experiment. I've decided to break the, uh, uh, the review up into two parts to keep the file size smaller. Um, so while we're here, uh, be sure to click on the subscribe button and uh, interim review part two should start automatically from the playlist, but if it doesn't, just go click on interim review part two.